Okay, so to introduce Alice, working in installation, sculpture and performance, Alice Shepherd Fiddler appropriates archaic art making traditions to investigate the unspoken rules of contemporary society. Her eclectic practice reflects her past training in set design and plays with her interests in architecture, environmentalism and the history of technology. Using theatrical tools and language to explore complex social issues, Shepherd Fiddler constructs what she refers to as temporary stagings, which appear on the point of departure, encouraging immersion in the moment. Her work is shown in group and solo shows, including this year's RWA annual open, and she's currently self-appointed artist in residence at the former Comrades Club in Nailsworth, while it remains a building site. She has an MA in Fine Art from UE Bristol and lives and works near Stroud, Gloucestershire. Alice, what have you got in the R RWA uh, open? Oh, yeah, I've got two photos, actually, photos of performance uh, pieces. Yeah, and, oh, um, yeah, well, yeah, they're of the, a work called The Rule. Oh, yes. Excellent. So they can be seen online at the moment because the, unfortunately, the, obviously the museum hasn't opened, but um, it will be opening, but all the works are online for sale, <laughs> as they keep telling me to promote. <laughs> well, there you go, that's an opportunity. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to hand over to you then, Alice, and um, if everybody could mute while Alice is talking, that'd be great. Okay, is that working? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Good, okay, all right, so. Okay. So uh, the talk that I'm giving today is about my project Sandbags, which uh, is in development uh, for the BRICS Micro Commission this autumn. Um, and I applied for the commission because since lockdown, uh, I've spent a lot of my energy helping my community and getting involved uh, with uh, community-based projects and uh, supporting my family. And um, as we went over the, uh, the beyond the summer, I realized that I really wanted to get back into the studio and focus on making uh, and more than that, touching materials and getting back into studio practice. So when the commission came up, I realized that it was an opportunity for me to focus on my work in that way. And so I applied and I was really excited to um, get it. Uh, so it came at the right time. Oh, how do I? Oh, how do... oh there I see I've got the button, there we go. And uh, the starting point for the, for the work, uh, the project was uh, really these two words, this, these two um, opposing acts, I suppose, of attention and neglect. And um, yeah, that's the starting point for the work. I have to remember to use my cursor, sorry. And uh, it all started really about three years ago, driving up and down the motorway, when I couldn't stop noticing uh, these sandbags on road signs. Um, and uh, the thing that caught my, my, my eye really was this, the fact that these sandbags were performing their function very well as they do, holding down these road signs, and the road signs were obviously there doing their important thing, but how the sandbags were to me as equally important as a sign, yet they were a sort of very cast aside object. And um, I, could not, I couldn't stop thinking about how important they were and um, yet how sort of invisible they were. And that's what uh, has been playing on my mind. So I feel for me, this piece of work has been in development for, for about three years. Um, and really it was this commission that's been able for me to actually start producing something physical from the thinking part of the making. Oh. And so um, I, started, you know, obviously researching um, about sandbags. That was the thing that really uh, caught my eye, not so much the road signs, but it was the sandbags. And uh, at the beginning of this year, particularly, I mean, I don't know how it affected everyone else, but it seemed to me that the, the amount of flooding and, and 
the amount we needed to control water became, uh, I don't know, it seemed to this year to be more acute than ever. I started photographing sandbags around the doorways around where I live and looking at how we were um, managing flood control. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it got me thinking about how uh, the, the relationship between sand and water and cloth, and particularly in relation to the refugee crisis, uh, these aren't bodies here, but they're just the, the, the residue of people being swept up on beaches. And it, it, I got to thinking about the, the sort of the cyclical uh, situation between cloth and sand and water and tides and uh, it's sort of repetitive endless cycle of these materials and uh, and time uh, in all the mix there and of course sandbags you know you can't really think of sandbags without their relationship to war and so they hold back water but they hold back bullets and um, and so these, these things that are just not the subject, but they are the subject. That's what I couldn't stop thinking about, attention and neglect. They're sort of, they're not the thing, yet they're the thing. And the top picture here is of them in, um, you can buy them as units for gaming. And the more I looked at them, the more I found them online on all the games that everyone's playing at the moment. And it just, again, it just um, surprised me how much you know, there they are and you can buy them, but they're just this thing that isn't a thing. Um, and so I made my first bag. Uh, I had some uh, uh, material in my studio already. Um, and some of you know that I already work in velvet, but I'll come to explain a bit more about that material um, in a minute. But so I looked up standard sizing and um, picked a standard size and made my first bag and I filled it with a standard amount of uh, sand, uh, building sand, kiln dried and um, the sand comes from a quarry in Cheshire and uh, it's processed. It's someone just waiting to come in there, shall I let them in? Or are you, can you see that? Yeah, it's all right, I'm, I'm letting people in. Thank you. And, um, and I wanted to sort of just begin Begin with a single unit and see how I felt about that. Um, and immediately, it, it, its presence was quite strong on my studio floor. It, it, it definitely had a presence. Oh, no, sorry, I keep trying to press the wrong button to move forward, sorry. Um, and then I knew pretty quickly that I needed to make some more. Um, and so um, along came another one. And, and then I started uh, buying fabrics um, online and um, it became quite apparent to me the, the, the palette that I was going to be working um, and it's fairly obvious I think that they are um, sort of flesh tones for want of a better word. It seemed the right uh, palette to be working in. It's a, a fairly monochrome palette. And, um, and I started picking up road signs off the roadside as well, because I wanted to see what would happen when I had sandbags, how they behaved with metal structures because of the original source of seeing them on the road signs uh, originally. And I wanted to see, okay, well, what, what's going on here then? What, what's important here? What's the soft material on the hard shape and where is the attention and neglect? What's the push and pull? The fabrics, of course, are old curtains. Um, does that matter? I wasn't sure, um, but certainly the age of the fabric mattered to me uh, and the textures and the fact that light has faded the fabrics um, and the fact that velvet is an expensive material to produce, it has value. Um, and also the tones were, not dissimilar to uh, the colors of the, the original Hessian bags that I've looked at in doorways. So there was a familiarity to the, the forms once I'd made them. It wasn't, they weren't shocking. And I could begin to work with them in a way that I'd seen them out and about. Um, of course, again, there's the fact that I was sewing and, and 
I've used textiles uh, in my past a lot and I feel very comfortable sewing and it was a real pleasure to actually get the sewing machine out again and um, yeah to be to be making in that way um, yeah and so here's an example of another bag resting on a metal frame And I realized that I needed to think more about the metal structures and what I might be putting them on. And so um, I went to the scrap heap and that was really exciting. Uh, it, it was clear to me that I wouldn't start making something completely from new. Recycling is really important for me. And I would have to think quite carefully before I started making something afresh out of uh, new material and so um yeah the scrap heap was very exciting uh, but also quite confusing as you can see i started pulling bits and bobs out um and uh, the gathering for me is important um to 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 source things in this way and so i started looking at how the bags looked on different metal shapes, what they did and how they behaved. And these are two bits of heavy metal bar. And what they did when they were in groupings. And then quite early on, I, uh, there were two images that had um, been influential alongside the road signs. Um, I don't know much about the artist uh, Letitia Badal Halsman, um, but this particular piece of work, I've since looked her up, but this particular piece of work, uh, I couldn't get it out of my head. And of course it's a, a soft form on a hard metal structure. So, in a way, to me, it was doing the same thing that sandbags were doing on the road signs. And um, this piece of work is, is um, well, she says it's, 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 it, she used a velvet to evoke a sense of, um, of uh, contempt and grief, and it's inspired by a text by the, uh, by the artist Jean Genet. And um, it, I don't know what it is about that, that piece of work that I like or that I was attracted to, but it, it's this, it's, it's, I think it's this just this relationship between the soft and the hard. But her work is, again, it's, it's modular and it changes and moves according to the space it's put in. And that really appeals to me. And those people that know my work will know that that is something that I like to be able to adapt a piece of work according to the surroundings. Uh, and Jess Darling, I really love her work. Um, this is a, a piece of a larger piece of work. Um, I think it exists as a, as a single piece of work, but it also goes into a, a, a landscape of work uh, that she, she had an exhibition in Paris. And she says that she sees the sculptures as mortal and vulnerable, as we all are. Um, and I was interested in the way that her, her sculptures become bodily. Uh, she says her objects, objects are bodily and complicated. Um, and, and I'm still trying to understand where, 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 which bits of body and how, how, how that language works between the metal and, and the soft forms and how we read that as body. Um, and interestingly, I feel I'm still sort of looking, looking into uh, how, she, how she works, but she, she says that she makes sculpture performance and works in Desin, Desin by design. And um, those of you who know Heidegger and uh, phenomenology, Desin means being there or, or existence. And, and so she's very much into um, the presence and the, the senses in uh, the, the human presence and being there. And I'll explain a bit more about that later on. So that's why that piece of works here. So then I'm going to talk about the recycling uh, of materials. So 
this piece of work that I made in 2019 is um, contract called Contract, and it's uh, jiffy bags filled with sand. So um, as I'm working again with sand now, I thought I'd show this piece because um, it's the same kind of sand. It's kiln dried builder sand from the same quarry in Cheshire. Um, I know, yes, the sand is totally ecologically friendly. It's been through certain processes to get to me, but I like the fact that I can reuse the sand um, and I see the sand as a nomadic material, as I see fabric that it, it, it's adaptable and, uh, and fluid. And again, the bags are adaptable and fluid and as the sandbags are now. Um, so that this piece obviously very much uh, bags filled with sand, it definitely uh, relates. And um, here is a piece of work that I made using um, aged velvet. Um, so again, the idea of, um, Revisiting the same materials is is um, well apparent here in 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 the work that I'm making now to this. And this piece here again used used age velvet. Um, this is called 1966. I made in 2018, um, and you can see here that the lines on this uh, velvet have been caused by sun fading. So I am interested in finding velvet that has the marks of age on it. Um, I like to think that the fabric holds time in its fibers. And that to me, um, yeah, helps, helps give, uh, time gives value to the, to the fabric and then to the object. So as I've been developing uh, the sandbags, I've been thinking a lot about uh, two artists. The first is uh, Doris Salcedo, Cedo, uh, and in particular this piece of work, a Ford de, Ford de PL, um, which I'd love to see in person. I haven't seen it, but um, I think it's an incredible piece of work made of um, sewn together rose petals. And, um, yeah, it's a very moving piece of work. It's so simple, but it's really complicated at the same time. And obviously she she approaches the general through the specific instances of personal loss. And um, I like the fact, I like the fact that she, you know, manages to, to make something so simple, yet it's so deeply touching. I don't know, it's, I like that, that idea of something really simple and then really, I don't know, the more you spend time with it, the more it affects you. And she often takes a, a historical event as her point of departure. And of course, Louise Bourgeois, these are three historical, three horizontals, and then the single on the right. Um, and of course she, she turned to stitching late in her life, having made with metal and, and uh, sort of more masculine materials. And um, I'm only, only just reading really about the whole um, world of stitching and female and textile art and, yeah, it's quite interesting. I never really thought about it so much, but of course I am working in textiles. <laughs> and so I thought I'd, um, you know, I'm constantly looking back at the photos of the sandbags that I, I, I started taking back at the beginning of the year. And uh, I've been playing around with putting my sandbags in different places and seeing how they how they look and how they perform and um, how, yeah, and what I think of them. And so looking at the, the recycling of actions. So here I begin to stack them 
And stacking is something that I've done quite a lot of my work, and obviously many artists have done, from Bancuzzi to, oh gosh, lots of people. I mean, it's nothing new, is it? Stacking stones or ch children's blocks or whatever. I think it's a very um, irresistible thing to do, I guess. Um, and I was looking at my notes. I wanted to, I wanted to see how they behaved in relation to thinking back to stacking as defense against water or bullets or anything like that and, and um, working with gravity, how, how they felt on top of each other and what did, it, what did they feel like. Um, yeah, it was kind of weird having them in the studio like that. And the intention here is to, I'd like to uh, make more and stack them higher. And um, I, I'm drawn to building as well because my father and my grandfather were architects. And I think building has been around me for quite a long time actually, from plans on, on um, workbenches to construction materials, I've been around that a lot. So building is, you know, I enjoy building, but I also enjoy taking things apart and putting them back together. I was brought up with a very strong ethos of make, do and mend and take things apart to see how they work and put them back together again. So I think that's uh, very much part of my practice. So here's another example of stacking. This is a piece I made in um, last year called 52, uh, concrete paving blocks, again, with slithers of velvet between. <clears throat> Close up. And then there's the idea of uh, repetition, which is obviously uh, something that I work with a lot. Um, the repetition in the size of the bags being equal, repetition of the amount of sand that's gone into them, and then repetition of their placement, um, perhaps to try to keep working out what it is that I that I don't understand yet about this question of attention and neglect, trying to understand these two opposing acts of attention and neglect. Um, yeah, I think maybe that's what the repetition is doing. And then the action of recycling, I've been back to the uh, scrapyard several times looking for um, more materials, still thinking about whether I should be welding something new to place them on and, and always not, always coming back with another bit of scrap metal and not able to move on from this idea of recycling and not able to, to make something new and shiny and fresh. It, it's, it's like, I, I just, I can't do it. <laughs> Even though I think I'd like to, I just can't because I just, I, I just value recycling too much. And I realized it's because it gives, for me, it gives value. Recycling adds value. And, and that for me really matters. So um, cutting up what I find is okay and working with what I find is okay, but making something new, I just can't seem to do it. Not new from scratch anyway. And the recycling of ideas. So. Here are some works that I made last, well, over the last two years where I take an object and start the, the a piece exists in one form and then it moves on and becomes another, another piece of work. And this piece actually has three stages to it and it never stops being one piece long enough before it goes on to be another piece, but it might be but who knows, and, and, um, and you'll see later on that I think that also happens in sandbags. The work keeps moving. And uh, 
it, yeah, it doesn't want to seem, it doesn't seem to want to stay. <laughs> and the work also adapts to its surroundings, like this piece that I've made called Feedback Loop, which again is completely different in each situation that it, it, it's installed in. Um, so it, it's tram transformed by its environment and uh, I have a funny feeling that sandbags will do the same thing. And my, my past um, career was as a set designer in TV and film and <clears throat> of course sandbags has been, have been around long before seeing, noticing them on roadsides. They were they're shoring up the sets of all the set builds that I've made over 20, well, 18 years, I suppose, of working in TV and film. And again, they just, it just makes me chuckle that they're doing this such an important job, but they're completely behind the scenes. I just love that so much that they're, they're completely unimportant, but they're sort of the most important thing. And I'm drawn back yet again to this thing of attention and neglect, which what, where's the performance happening, really? Where's, where's the, where should our attention be focused, really? Or where is the, where's the action or where's the performance? And um, yeah, it's, it's, and the function, the, the, the action or the function, where's it happening? And so I laid the bags out flat to see if they could perform differently um, from the stack. Um, seeing, different, seeing what they did differently, how do they behave differently? Oh gosh, I really can't get used to this cursor. I'm sorry, I'm getting there. And somebody mentioned uh, to me about um, Sean Scully and how he, he's taken his paintings and, and turned them into sculptures. And I thought that was quite interesting because I haven't really, I mean, of course I know his work, but I haven't really spent a huge amount of time looking at it. And I, I found that really interesting, to, that idea of, of playing around with things from, from one dimension to another. Um, yeah, I'm gonna spend some more time thinking about this, but, but his, it says, I've, I've spent my life making the melancholic into something irresistible. I thought that was quite interesting. And um, he, obviously he comes from a mining family and he's used to hard work and toil. And, and it's funny that he's making these huge, heavy sculptures and, and that his work's been referred to as timeless. And I, and I wondered, you know, how does time fit in work? What, how do you measure time in a piece of work? And very recently, uh, only a week ago, uh, somebody mentioned this artist who I've, I've never heard of before. And she, uh, she's fascinating. It's really worth a, a look at. Probably, maybe everyone knows it apart from me, but um, I think she, she opted out of the complete art scene. Uh, and it, again, I need to find out more about her, but she, she chose to make a modular, modular pieces of work that, a part of a system and invited people to to make the involve themselves in the work and in the gallery spaces and and put them together and make them into the get involved and they it's, it's social work you know it's socially engaging and and um she's sort of taken the emotion away and given the given the power to the people and i i found that really fascinating as a it's just a very refreshing way of looking at looking at how to make work, but a lot of her a lot of her thinking aligns with me, with the relationship to building and and modular and repeated imagery and things. And I I haven't quite unpicked the latter part of the, the material materially. I understand it, but the next part of 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 this these sort of um, Oh, I don't know how to describe it, but um, oh, 
she's just worth reading up about. I can't explain, but just this sort of letting go. It seems about as far away from the works of Jess Darling as I can imagine. These two, uh, you know, I need to look at Jess Darling's work and then, and then Charlotte Pesensky's work and, and work out what's going on between them. <laughs> That's what I've got to do. And so recently I, I heard um, a podcast, a, a radio program about self-care, uh, radical self-care as a, a collective political will. And obviously this year has been all about care, you know, uh, uh, self-care or selfishness or, you know, NHS. And, um, and I can't, you know, I, I think back to, refugees and people in crisis and how do we how do we make sense of care that's really how, how do we make sense of care and, and what does it what does it mean to us for ourselves as individuals and, and for other people and so where's the work now where is where is sandbags and so it, it's 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 taken on a few different forms at the moment like my work does it, sometimes it's like this. And sometimes it's like this on a shelf that's borrowed from another piece of work. And finally, it's like this at the moment on a chair from another piece of work. Thank you. That was really interesting, Alice. Thanks so much for sharing what you've been working on. I love that last image, actually. It's quite... Um, it, it's quite comical, I think, that one. It, remind, it really reminds me of... Um, is it Beryl Cook or Beryl Reed? I always forget which is the surname. Cook, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the way, yeah, and the way that they're kind of toppling almost on top of each other. Um, I've got a few uh, questions, but I'm going to open it up to the floor first. If anyone wants to jump in with a question, please unmute yourself and go for it. Um, I, I, uh, I had to. I had to slip out for five minutes. I was really sorry, but I may have missed the bit where you talked about why velvet. You probably talked extensively about why velvet, did you? I didn't, no. I was going to come back to it, actually. So, um, well, yeah, why velvet? Um, the thing I like about velvet is that it's, um, it's a fabric of value. Um, so it's, it's, it's expensive to produce, expensive to make. Um, and so it's compared to, well, compared to quite a lot of fabrics, it's, it's an, it's, it's expensive material. Um, and I like, I like that fact. I like the fact that it has, it has a, has a value. Uh, and so very much in this case, it matters to me that it, it's, it's has, has that value. Mm. Um, and also it holds dust in its fibers. And so it's, it's it's storing. It's a it's a vessel for storing, um, and then it it um, records time because it fades, and so it's yeah a time capsule. You know, it's it's a, a clock if you like, <laughs> um, and also because it's like skin, it's like flesh, and it's 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 um, sensual. Yeah. Well, I, I, I loved your presentation and I loved the work and I look forward to seeing more of it. It's fantastic. I really enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. <laughs> I wondered if um, it might be of interest to you. You probably know his work already, but looking at Barry Flanagan's work. Oh, yeah. The light on light on sax, um, partly because that kind of combines your enjoyment of the, um, the sort of setting and sand, although it's not, it's not, um, they're not sandbags, they're Hessian sacks, but they are, he's working with sand. And it just reminds me of his feeling that sculpture is what appears to the consciousness. It's what, it's not plonking something and saying, you know, it's all about this. It's actually 
making us aware of something we previously weren't or bringing something to our consciousness mm -hmm. and so I love the way you work because I think that's there's a real kind of fidelity not in a kind of modernist sense no, fidelity to materials but there's a real listening to to what the objects and, and fabrics and so on are are conveying and I, I couldn't help feeling that in some ways by choosing that sort of soft felt there is there is a, a sort of human element that enters in it, it, um, you know um it's kind of impossible not to sort of those flesh tones really do point up a sort of conjoinment or a crossover between um protection and um internal vulnerability and I think because a sandbag is a protective um, uh, attempt, but in some ways there's a pathos in the slumping that is sort of really speaks to me about our current moment of, of attempting to protect, but kind of both protecting and hurting. And it's, it's all those kind of, yeah, mm, exactly. Not in the mix there, but beautifully sort of pared down. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'd forgotten about Barry Flanagan. That's so funny. Isn't it funny that I've made all that work and forgotten about him? <laughs> it's so easily done, isn't it? And they can, someone can be a formative influence when you're a student and you, you, you kind of go, you move away and then you don't realise it's still filtering in or recurring. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Can I, can I just talk about, um, Alice, hi there. Um, about, you were talking about bourgeois in, in kind of, you know, uh, direct hands about reparation and um, and I just wanted to um, sort of point out as opposed to ask a question that her family business was a tapestry restoration business so that she came from and, and I was thinking about you and your past set you know it's like the, 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 the practice that you have now is directly in relation to, to you know your past interests and past work even if, you know because I know you struggled with that over time and you've sort of come out the other end but I I just wanted to say that um, Bourgeois um, made made her fabric pieces for 30 years or so so it wasn't it wasn't a kind of like it was later in some ways but it it um, it directly relates back and then there, there's a real kind of opposing forces in her work that you were talking about and, and attention and neglect and I was thinking about the word attention as a tension as well mm. but wordy way um anyway i just that sort of pulling apart and going going together i'm going to mute now because i'm in the gallery and i've got to go can i add something as well hi alice hi. um thank you so much for that i love hearing about your work it's really yeah absolutely stunning um the i was interested in um when you were talking about stacking the sandbags and that you were planning to stack more um and then later when you were talking about um, Charlotte Pozaneski, is that her work? Um, I don't know how you pronounce it, but the modular artwork. Um, and it reminded me of the, the loose parts kind of play theory. I think maybe we've talked about this in one of our crits, I can't remember. Um, but the idea of bringing in loose parts for, for children to play with, but I think it's directly um, as appealing to adults, but pieces that you can rework and you know kind of modular but it doesn't actually have to be modular like a sandbag as well, a unit that you can play with and build things with um and I wonder it just made me want to interact with them and they're so they look so tactile I just wonder if that's something you'd ever consider kind of handing the work over to a, an audience you know or you know enabling other people to kind of put them in different things or, or rework the works as you do um yeah, because I, I just I want to get involved basically. <laughs> so yeah, just... I know. I, I, I'm I'm at that point now where I, I just I just don't know. I can't decide whether this is it's it's just coming up for me now. And that's when her when she was she was suggested to me, and I suddenly thought, gosh, how do I feel about that? You mm. know, because there's something about her work that I really really respect. You know, and if you you know, she's got some fantastic values, and. Um, and a lot of them I share, but then I wonder how much I want to not give of my work, you know, and I, yeah. it's a really interesting moment when you, when you make something and, you know, when, at what point do you hold on and what, you know, I wasn't yeah. I'm not sure, I'm not ready to make that decision, but. Yeah, I wonder about the overlap with performance as well, and perhaps it's something that people could 
you know, when you were showing photo, you know, obviously static photos of the reworkings of your other pieces. Um, and you can kind of see, you know, I mean, I feel like I could see in my mind's eye you like rearranging them in the studio and kind of making them into new things. And that in itself would be a really interesting process. And it's almost like seeing the, them being built, you know, seeing them being rearranged by the artist would be interesting too, I think. But anyway, that's it's so fascinating. There's so many different routes yeah. it, could, it could go down. I already has, of course. Can I, can I um, ask for a crit for myself on this very subject in about two months' time? Because I'm grappling with the same dilemma. How much do I want to give objects to people to move about and perform with <laughs> or not? You know, it's a really difficult decision, especially when you've got something tactile like velvet, mm -hmm. because you know that practically people aren't going to take the same care of it as you might and also you want them to be playful with it but then it's quite hard to rel relinquish that that control maybe and that preciousness that you have for the materials. Can I say something? Uh, thanks Alice that was really really great and really interesting. Um, I, yeah, as you know I come from a textile background originally and so, and I was a silk weaver and I have woven silk velvet. And um, so when you were talking about the fabric and the materials all the time, I was constantly thinking about the actual velvet itself. And when you were talking about the old curtains and things, of course, contemporary velvet is not valuable. It's not difficult to weave and it's crap. Mm -hmm. And most, not most people, but there will be a predominance in the world, in houses, of velvet which is, doesn't hold all those connotations and it doesn't fade. Mm. So there's a, I, I just kept hearing when you kept saying all those things about the age of it and the value of it, I just kept thinking, mm, to a point. So that, that was one issue. And then, I mean, it wasn't an issue, but it just kept coming up for me. Mm. And then um, the other thing was, how you made the bags with the thickness of the velvet, because they were that, that thick, beautiful cotton velvet. Um, therefore, you had the salvage, and you had the salvages on the outside, and then quite a lot of bunching where the where you tied them at the top. And I am sure every detail was considered and thought about, so I'm not suggesting it wasn't. Um, but I'm, it, it affects the way it acts as a sandbag because it has that bunching at the top. A sandbag is equal all the way round and it becomes something other to me when it's bunched. It comes a bit more like a hot water bottle cover or it has a relation to a hot water bottle, well, it, which it, also you know, flops and holds and, and does its job and is ignored, but is very important. Mm -hmm. But so it was just a whole lot about the 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 uh, yeah, the material itself, and then lots more about the material in relation to hardness too that I would, I've been thinking about. But I'll leave it at one thing. <laughs> so it's not a question really. It's just what my mind was doing as I was watching the. Uh, I mean, it, it, no, they're good. They're good observations. I mean, a lot of sandbags are tied, Anna. Just anyway, they're not all sewn as a like a bean bag actually. Right. Okay. A lot of them historically are tied. Interestingly enough. Um, but um, yes, and I've, uh, yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, so I have thought about every detail. <laughs> <laughs> sure you have. <laughs> but um, I get your, I get your hot water bottle reference. I think that's, perhaps that's quite a useful one, actually. Yeah. I think it was just the, the, the bundle at the top. It's the way, it's the way it, it changes how it works as a sandbag. It, it radically alters its kind of, the, what it does at one end, mm. because the material is so much thicker. Mm. I, I've, I've put a slightly different, going back to what um, Jessica was saying, um, Irvin Verm is someone to look at also for looking at how audience gets involved with making sculptures. He's done a whole load of work about the one minute sculpture. He What's put, Irvin Verm, it's in the chat. I've put it in the chat. Um, he's an Austrian artist and he basically um, has things with instructions of how to interact with, with the objects that he leaves in the gallery space. Um, 
it's very playful but he also works with that idea of function a lot and um so some of the things are made of wood and you 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 put yourself into them you you sort of place yourself into them so some of them are throwaway objects and other things are quite molded or whatever definitely worth looking at aesthetically completely different to what you're doing but something there i think um, yeah. I, can I, can I in on margaret is that all right Hi. thanks alice fantastic talk um really love the way you um you know look at every detail reflect on every detail of the materials their history and i had one question that um came up um, how do you work with the tension between the meaning of the object that you're using and that you're recycling? Um, where does it then turn more into sort of the meaning of the material, just as a material? So it was one piece, I think it was 1966 that you showed. Mm. You could see it was a curtain mm. that had a history. Mm. So I was wondering how important for you is it in that piece that it is a curtain? And how um, does it sort of work with the age and the history of purely the material? Because you could still see the past function of what the object was. And yeah, I'd quite like to know how you work with that. Yeah, it, it's interesting. In that piece, in fact, um, in that piece, it's quite a few, yeah, it's, it's well, four curtains, you know. Um, and in that piece specifically, I'm working directly with with its own story, you know, and I've and I've I've um, I wanted to to um, uh, draw attention to the existing story more. Uh, yes, I've I've worked with it, if you see what I mean, mm -hmm. and and by manipulating the material, I've focused more on the story, if you see what I mean, in that piece. You mean like the the memory of the material. You work more with the memory of the material? Uh, oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. So, um, yes, I think with that one I did. Yeah, I'm trying to do it work out. I'm trying to sort of... Uh, well, yes and no, because of course it, it is partly that, but it, then of course it does take on its own new meaning once it's formed into its into its new form. So, but in, I'm trying to think how it compares to the to the new piece of work where the existing properties of the materials are merely aiding; they're almost like propping up the new meaning. Whereas in that piece, I think they're as as important as the new meaning. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and um, just one other piece, the 52, where you have the concrete blocks and then the velvet in between. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed that tension between the materials and yeah. Yeah. what you were working with in that piece. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. So that's all about, all about, um, again, it, often in my work, it's the, it's two, two opposing uh, feelings, sensations, uh, experiences, or something like that. So with that, yes, the, the, exactly. That's to do with, uh, on one level, it's it literally to do with, you imagine you've got a soft, fl floppy bit of velvet and you're sticking it between two hard bricks and then you've got the weight of the whole thing pushing down. You've got, that. that's definitely, you've got opposing forces and textures, but then it operates on a, on a, on a large scale thing and it becomes something else. But very directly, yes, you're looking at those immediate qualities and forces. Mm. But yes, it's it's it's. I can talk to you more about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Victoria, did you want to ask something? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking, and maybe you guys could help me with this. Um, I wonder if Alice, it might be worth looking at a German artist who showed at Arnolfini about 10 years ago. And it's just struck me that they're all soft sculptures. They're all modular and you can sit on them. And um, Cosima von Bonin, right, Cosima right. von Bonin. Let me just write that in there. Uh, and I think it might give you a sense of whether you, it's not, you know, that you do exactly do the same thing, but whether you'd be interested in doing that. 
Mm. And what, because her, because by doing that, she brings in sort of questions around economics and, you know, it, it's so true. You have to be so careful, don't you, to intuit what, what you're drawing attention to and what you're not. Uh, yeah, and similar, you, know, um, you were saying the same, Jess, Jess, in terms of that tension between how far do you go with sharing the objects. But I think you might really enjoy her work. It's slightly surreal, but it has that kind of, great big soft sculptures that you can sit on and move around mm. um, the other thing was saying it was talking about um, what you invite in terms of audience response because I made a sort of a piece called um, consider yourself part of the furniture which was made out of furniture fabrics and was a sort of slumped uh, soft sculpture and I mean it wasn't a strong piece of work but it got kicked the out of and it got um, attacked you know with um, some kids came in and just um, and it made me realize you know and I felt very physically impacted by that because I knew I guess there was a kind of fragility and a, a, a person in that kind of and and so I just I, I'm only putting that out there because of that sort of sense in which how much we invest in materials and those soft fabrics what gets to me is I'm thinking about they're kind of furniture fabrics so when you talk about the tension, it's kind of because they incorporate both the home and the outside, the protection, they're the sort of, they bring in the sort of home associations of a, a furniture fabric or a curtain fabric and a, a defense, you know, at the same time, sorry. It's, no, it's really interesting you've touched on that because I was very aware when I was working with uh, the color choices that not only are they, you know, flesh tones, but also that, um, you know, they're with for home furnishings, you know, they're, they're comforting colors. And of course the comforting colors are colors that we, that of our, of our skin, you know, there's this weird sort of cycle of, I like them in my home because they feel nice. They feel nice because they remind me of my skin. And this sort of, this sort of w weird, weird sort of, um, sort of, yes, like you say, this sort of protective thing going on. And then, yes, how much are you prepared to then put that out there to, to, you know, it's very vulnerable, but, you know, and then how much in your work are you, how much of is the personal in your work and how much are you prepared really to, to, to really put it out there for, you know, there's one thing putting it on the plinth, there's another thing having it kicked about literally or, or verbally or whatever, you know, it's, it's, yeah. And I think that's where that there's a strength in what you're doing because it's, it's um, considered enough and, and um, not neutral, but there's a kind of standing away for it to be both personal and, I don't know, kind of, um, it doesn't invite that kind of, it invites a sense of fragility, but not an attack. It's, mm. it's, it's more considered, I think, maybe. Carol? Yeah, I, I just wanted to sort of, I think probably support you in deciding not, although I've mentioned Irvin Verm, who works very much also with photography. So he's got people in relation to the, that become the sculpture, very different approach again. But there's something about, I mean, what you just said really about how people then ab abuse that in a sense, they started to attack the thing. And there's something about the fragility of the of the materials that you're using, but also um, the very clear uh, um, ideas that you have with them that I think it's, it, and also the idea of an object that's normally hidden. I don't think you need to kind of invite people in. There's something very playful about an object like that, like that you would sit on or that you would play with. And the fact that you're not inviting people to touch it, I think has its, has something there that it brings that tension better into play somehow. Okay, that's interesting, yeah. Because it's normally touched, basically. It's normally touched. So, you know, it would make you think about, you know, those those um, juggling things or, or, or those, those Cushion, those big cushions that you could sit on or all those things the fact that you're not inviting people to touch them I think is more interesting than if you do in this particular instance it's not against all no, that, that's interesting because that then relates back to this sort of quandary between the attention and neglect exactly yeah, yeah. 
I think somehow it highlights it more by not letting that happen. And also, you could kind of push more the, um, you know, the modular recycling kind of performance element where you are the person that's controlling the change to the exhi exhibition. You know, if you had a really big space and all these different objects over. Right. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Yeah. I've got a space. Um, you know, over time and then each each time, you know, you come, it's it's different. That would be really interesting to kind of figure out how you can use time in that way, I suppose. I mean, not that no one's ever done that before, but you know, it'd be interesting to see it with these different sort of elements you're working with. Um if anyone if anyone has any last comments, do they want to say them now? Because I think we're up for time. I'm just writing down what's written on the thing here. Um, so thank you very much, Alice. That was really fascinating and obviously lots to talk about. Um, we look forward to hopefully seeing your work in the in the fleshy sandbag. <laughs> in the <sandbag> flesh. <laughs> um, and we're having a break for Christmas. So our next talk is on Wednesday, the 6th of January. And I think that's with Anna Haydock Wilson, whose practice is community focused. Um, the link will be the same. Um, so please join us if you can for that. And um, thank you again. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye. Thanks, all.